Thank you, President Riggs. And uh, David, you're a hard act to follow. In the past 24 hours, in fact, as I was listening to your classmates speak, I was thinking that I finally have a sense, truly, in so many ways, of what it means to be Gettysburg great. So I'm honored to be following you. I'm so honored to be receiving this degree with Carl Matson, who's such a wonderful person. And I am absolutely inspired and excited to be here with the class of 2012 as you graduate. So I thank you, President Riggs. I thank you, distinguished faculty who clearly care so much about the students, the staff, the team here, the alumni and the trustees who give so much, to the proud parents and grandparents who love so much, to the inspired siblings and friends. I could not thank you more. And you, the graduates, you have earned this moment. So no matter how exhausted or bleary-eyed you might feel from celebrating last night, and I've talked to a couple of you already who said you couldn't sleep all night just having the jitters, no matter how tired you are, I want you to just look to your left, and then look to your right, good, and take, just take this moment and feel it. Because so often life just rushes by us and we forget the most critical moments in our lives. And what is so important to do is to truly live in the minutes. And this is one of those minutes you don't ever want to forget. So hold it all in, feel it, know with your body and your soul that you did it. You really did it. So congratulations. I remember being in your seat like it was yesterday, full of so many questions and yet a lot of certainty too. And just like you, I was coming into the job market when the country was coming out of a recession. And I had decided that um, because I had paid for my education and I would worked so hard, that the best thing for me to do would be to take some time off before I went into the real world. Well, as you can imagine, my parents thought that was a miserable idea. And, um, and yet, my parents are quite wise. And so they negotiated with me that at least I should go through the college interviewing process. And so I took my resume, I bought a suit, and I put it in the boxes dutifully for foreign affairs and economics majors. My first uh, interview was with Chase Manhattan Bank, as Chris said. And I walked into the interview, sat across the table from this handsome recruiter, and he asked me what would turn out to be the easiest and the hardest question. He said, so tell me, Ms. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? And I'm a terrible liar. And so I said, well, actually, I don't want to be a banker. Um, my parents made me do this interview. I really want to change the world. And he said, well, that's just too bad. Because if you got this job, you would be in 40 countries in the next three years learning all about the economics and the politics and the people of those places. And the truth was, all I ever had wanted to do to that point was to know the world, to travel it and understand its people. And I was feeling this great opportunity flying away. So I stared at him and I said, do you think my, we might do this interview over? And he said, sure. So I left the room, knocked on the door, walked in, extended my hand and introduced myself, and he said, again, tell me, Ms. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was six years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. <laughs> Shockingly, I got the job. And as it turned out, I loved being a banker. I loved to see what it meant to take money and invest in entrepreneurs and ideas and see those ideas turn into jobs and sometimes into things of beauty. What I didn't like was that poor people were not in the mix at all. The banks thought it was too risky, too expensive, too difficult to lend to the poor. And low-income people themselves were often too frightened even to walk into the doors of the bank. And so three years after starting, I decided that there had to be a better way. And I had heard about Professor, Professor Yunus, who was making tiny loans to women in Bangladesh. People were just starting to hear about it. And I thought I would try my hand at doing the same, only in Africa. Well, clearly, I was the only one that thought this was a good idea. 
My boss told me I was making the worst career decision of my life, and he literally gave me a book called The Innocent Anthropologist. My friends thought I had lost my mind. My little brothers and sisters thought they would never see me again. But the most difficult, painful conversations, as you could imagine, were with my mother and my father. And now looking back at what they were going through, I understand their daughter, who had a promising career, was leaving Wall Street to go to a continent very few people really understood, to a place they couldn't find on a map, to do something they couldn't explain to their friends. But I knew somehow in my deepest being that I had to do it. And that if I didn't do it then, I might never do it again. And I knew as well how fiercely I loved them and felt connected to my family, and that somehow I wouldn't let them down. And so with a mix of love and sadness and great excited anticipation, I boarded a plane for Africa and cried the whole way there. But I ended up in Rwanda and I met a group of Rwandan women and together we started the country's first microfinance bank. And there I saw that indeed a small group of people really can change the world. I tell you these stories because there will be moments in your life when you have to make those hard decisions that can only come from listening to the deepest part of yourself. And you will certainly have those moments if you decide to venture out and try to do something few have ever done. And I don't say this lightly. I personally know it comes at a price. You will find that people might not always understand you. You might even close off certain relationships. But in paying that price, you will discover who you really are and what you are capable of doing. And of course, that journey of change and of self-discovery comes with the high risk of falling flat on your face, repeatedly. I have fallen down and gotten up more times than I can say. But as that great American philosopher, John Wayne, used to say, life is about getting up one more time than you've been knocked down. We've become a society seeking instant gratification. We want simple answers, clear pathways to success. But as you all know from the many community projects you've undertaken, from the very world around you, life does not work that way. And instead of looking for answers all the time, my wish for you is that you get comfortable living the questions. As the poet Rilke said, Try to love the questions themselves, as if they were locked rooms or books writing in a foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now, perhaps then someday, far in the future, gradually, without your even noticing it, you will live your way into the answer. For me, one of the biggest questions we face in the world today is how to build a world beyond poverty. To confront that challenge, both materially and spiritually, we need to renew and revitalize our systems of government and of capitalism. Mostly, we need a new kind of leadership, one based in building trust and moral imagination, or the, the ability to put yourself in another person's shoes and build solutions from their perspective. The world is so complex and interconnected, more than ever today. Just think about it. The wealthy live better than kings and queens of history. And yet 1.5 billion people among us, one in five, have never had a glass of clean drinking water. The same amount have never been able to turn on a switch to light their homes and are consigned to dirty, polluting, dangerous kerosene. And one in three of us have never had a toilet and have no access. And in the words of my young nephew, Christian, that isn't good for any of us. This divide between rich and poor is too stark. It is too unsustainable. And ultimately, it strips us of our collective dignity. And people your age all around the world know it. They see it. And they are calling in the streets for dignity. The tectonic plates of society are quickly, dramatically shifting. You can hear them creaking, pushing, moving to fever pitch with the Arab Spring, clanging with dissonance of the financial crisis, singing with hope of the Occupy movement. Planet Earth is full 
Planet Earth is sw swirling, full of possibility, yet somehow tumbling with confusion, seemingly not knowing which way is up. And everywhere, everywhere I go, people are asking, where are our leaders? From my work with Acumen, I am privileged to meet extraordinary individuals all around the world. They dare to dream and put their dreams into action. Usually, they fail again and again until they win, even if their dreams don't look exactly like they did when they started. I think of one of our investees, Shafi Mather, who decided that he wanted to fix the broken ambulance system in India. In India, if you want to go to a hospital, you call a taxi. If you want to go to send someone to the morgue, that's when you call an ambulance. And so Shafi decided there had to be a better way. And he started with just nine ambulances donated by friends and family. And everybody thought it was a fool's errand. Well, today, with patient capital invested in hard work and lots of bumps along the road, his company has almost 1,000 ambulances, 5,000 employees. They served a million people this year. By the end of the year, he's going to be the fourth or fifth largest ethical ambulance company in the world. And if Shafi can do it, you can do it. He saw something broken, and he decided to fix it. And I think of a, young, a group of young leaders just out of university I met a week ago in Peshawar, in northern Pakistan, on the Afghan border. It's a place known mostly for burqas, for suicide bombers, and for desperation. Yet, there I met young people who want to see a different future, and they are intent on creating it. Despite the risks of speaking out, Despite the risks of collective action, they used Facebook and other social media to get 4,000 people onto the streets of Peshawar to pick up the litter, whitewash the graffiti-laden walls, and clean up and green their city. They are not waiting for any political leaders to tell them what to do. They are doing it themselves. And they are just like you. They are your counterparts. They dream a better world. They want to do something about it, even if they don't know where to start, even though if they don't have the answers. What I've been thinking about lately is that mostly, I think they want to be seen. They want their lives to matter. They want to know that they can make a difference before they die, just like I imagine all of you do. I was so struck that some of you sent in notes to President Riggs, who passed them on to me to help me prepare for today's graduation, and I thank you for your generosity and for the wor words which so embodied the spirit of Gettysburg Great. Nearly all of you mentioned community and learning and the idea, idea that you want to meet the challenges of the world in big and in small ways. And just by reading your words, I came to like you a lot. And in liking who you already are, I want even more for you to come to know and love the world even in the most faraway places. I want you to become more in touch with your counterparts who are like you in so many ways, even if those similar, their similarities are not immediately evident. I think of a young group of men I know and whom am close to who live in the vast and sprawling slums of Nairobi, Kenya. When my book came out, a guy named Kevin, third grade educated, HIV positive, read the book. And then he sent me a long text message, which was essentially a review of the book. And in it, he said that he related to me because like me, he also had failed many times in his life. And like me, he also wanted to bridge the gap between rich and poor. And I was so taken by this spirit that I wrote him back and I said, if you have other friends who want to read the book, tell me how many and I'll send you the book. He asked for 100. Um, I sent them to him. And then he, and Nat, by now a small group of his friends, created a book club. And the next time I went to Nairobi, they hosted 100 people in the slums to discuss poverty from this book, which was an extraordinary experience. And it gave them so much confidence that they read other books. And then they started a business comp comp competition. And then they heard about TED and TEDx. And I know that you all recently had what I hear was an extraordinary TEDx organized by Steve Meehan and others. Well, these guys decided they wanted to do TEDx in the slums. They had no internet, but that didn't stop them. They burned CDs with the, the TED Talks 
um, so they could bring in voices from other countries. And they decided that they were so sick and tired of all of the workshops being held in the slums focusing on HIV, microfinance, and so many of the, 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 the activities in those slums being well-intentioned Ameri Americans coming to save them, though they clearly weren't asking anyone to do that. They wanted to save themselves. So they found the best graffiti artists and journalists, uh, entrepreneurs and teachers, and they had them speak. And it caught the attention of the TEDx organizers. And today, Kevin and his band of brothers have organized more than 40 TEDx's across East Africa. And two days ago, I literally got a, another text message from Kevin, who clearly texts me regularly. And he said that he had just been in Doha, Qatar, where he had been on the stage explaining to 750 organizers from around the world what it took to spread ideas from the world through slum communities. All of us are needed to renew the world, every single one of us. And each of you, more than any time in history, with the privilege of your Gettysburg degree, has it in your hands to serve, to work across boundaries, to inspire, to create the future you dare to dream. Your education at Gettysburg has taught you to be insatiably curious, to keep learning, and the world needs you more than ever. The good news is that there are so many opportunities for your leadership. They're just simply disguised as insoluble problems. I want you to think about the richness of life focused on what it takes to bring clean energy to millions of people who would otherwise live in darkness, or finding ways to use technology and bashing through bureaucracy to find a way to bring education to every child on the planet, whether they live in an urban slum or a wealthy suburb. Each of you is needed. Each of you has the chance to make a dent if you have the curiosity, the determination, and the focus to do so. And if I have any wisdom at all to share with you, it is this. First, focus on being interested, not on being interesting. Don't make decisions according to title or status or position. Pursue opportunities where you will learn about the world. Disciplines, practices that will teach you how better to contribute. Follow incredible leaders. Focus more on listening and learning. The rest will come. Two, don't worry about what other people think of you. If I have learned anything in my life, it is that most people are too busy worried about themselves to care. So take risks. Ask the dumb questions. Fail if you have to, and then get up and do it again. Three, avoid cynicism. The poet Adrian Rich wrote, so much has been destroyed, I have cast my lot with those who age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. The pessimists can tell us what is wrong with everything, but ultimately it is up to the optimists to dare to make the change. Four, remember you are standing on str strong shoulders. Daily, I am astounded at how dependent we are on the work and ideas of so many who have come before. And I'm not talking only about the greats. Before you finished getting out of bed, brushing your teeth with clean tap water, putting on clothes, making breakfast, turning off the light, walking out the door, you are benefiting from the work of hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals from all around the world. They've all deserve your spirit of generosity. So walk with humility and reverence for the human endeavor and know it's your job to help take that endeavor forward. You're incredibly blessed as well to have attended a school on the hallowed grounds made famous not only by a battle, but by a president whose quest for justice ensured that what happened there would not be forgotten. It is for us the living, Abraham Lincoln wrote, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Of course he was talking about human equality, and it is to your generation to have the opportunity to help us find ways to extend that ideal to every human being on the planet. And if we can, we must. You will hold the spirit of Gettysburg always in your heart and you will be a part of the school's own legacy forever as well. 
So remember that inspiring hope in a cynical world might be the most radical thing you can possibly do. Hope may not feed us, but it is hope that sustains us. And I am not talking about an easy, treacly hope, but a hope full of power and love, of grit and resilience. It is inside every single one of you. The path won't be easy, but nothing of importance ever is. So class of 2012, I congratulate you. I celebrate you. And now I want to challenge you. I urge you to lead your life in the minutes, to live the questions, to walk out of this place with your arms extended, being ready for all of the extraordinary experiences, good and bad, that life will hold for you. The world needs you to be the greatest generation we have ever had. And from the time I've been able to see you already, I have no doubt that you're up to the task. So congratulations. God bless you. Godspeed. And good luck.